So our second talk this morning is uh, from Dr. Reinhard uh, Waring. He's a professor of uh, mechanical engineering um, at the University of Alberta. Uh, in industry, he's worked on research and development of several uh, respiratory therapeutics, including inhalable insulin and a nasally administered influenza vaccine flu mist. Um, he, Dr. Baring is the lead, um, was the lead inventor of the co-suspension formulation technology that has been used in three registered products for AstraZeneca. At the University of Alberta, his group collaborates with nonprofit organizations to develop vaccines and bacteriophages for global health applications. He serves as the president of the Edmonton chapter of the Society of Catholic Scientists, and his talk is a Catholic perspective on pharmaceutical development in and for developing countries. Dr. Baring. Well, thank you very much for the invitation and the opportunity to speak. I better set a clock here so I'm not running completely over the time. Okay, that'll help me. Okay, so I'd like to talk about um, pharmaceutical development from a Catholic perspective, which might be a bit of an unusual task. Um, so I, I thought I'd start with the Bible. So this is the, um, the healing of the man born blind. And then go into uh, theological reasons for why the service to the sick and suffering has always been so important to the church. So there are three, uh, probably many more than three, but three very prominent ones. First of all, we understand that the church is the mystical body of Christ. So that means we um, ought to continue the healing ministry of Christ. That is part of the church life. And that means um, restoring the whole person. So it's, it's a little bit different from what we now, nowadays see as healthcare, where we just focus in on physical ailments. But here we're thinking more along physical, um, moral, and spiritual health as a unity. Uh, then secondly, we have um, health care directly as service to Christ. So Christ identifies in the gospel as the sick person, and uh, you know, if, if we help the sick, we directly serve, uh, serve Christ. And then on, on top of that, Jesus gave actually a direct command to his um, disciples in the commission to cure the sick, uh, among other things. And what I'd, what I'd like to point out here is that um, it came with the admonition to, um, to do this for free. Right? You have the sentence here, without cost you have received, without cost you are to give. And this is a topic that I will, or a theme that I will get to uh, several times in this talk. Okay, um, early on in the life of the church, there were some um, saints that took this very seriously. I think uh, perhaps most prominently St. Cosmas and Damien, uh, who are the um, patron saints of physicians, surgeons, and pharmacists. And they practiced um, medicine without fees. And uh, that's one of the, um, the group of saints that are called the unmercenaries. So instead of uh, being a mercenary and doing things for, for money, they uh, went the opposite way and, and, and gave it away for free. And uh, yeah, this is a medieval representation of them where you can see here um, typically um, working on the, the Galen type of medicine with the, um, the liquids or the fluids. And, and also it's reported that they invented some pharmaceutical preparations. So if we uh, go further a little bit into monasticism, so that's uh, third century pretty much. Um, there we have um, in the rules for the early monasteries, um, precepts for the care of the sick. And they are very central. So even the first rules of Pacomius, um, but then certainly uh, the rule of St. Benedict um, places the care of the sick here above and before other duties, uh, as if Christ was directly served. So you can see that now we have um, healthcare in the first uh, monastic communities at a, at a very high level, and that also um, led to the formation of the first hospitals, actually. Now, in medieval times, um, pharmaceutical science is largely herbalism, 
Uh, and I was intrigued to find this plan for the Benedictine Abbey of St. Gaul, uh, where you can see how that actually materialized into actual um, uh, arrangements here. So you have the um, infirmary here uh, with living chambers and uh, uh, fire and, and uh, dormitories and so forth. Uh, house for bloodletting up here. Uh, the doctor's house, uh, interestingly, together with the very sick, so the emergency room, so to speak, is directly next to the doctor. Uh, and here's the, the herb garden right next to it, separate from the uh, veggie garden, which is over here. And the precursor for um, pharmacies are these uh, drug storages here that are called apotheca. Um, so I think we can say that in, in the uh, 8th to 12th century, um, healthcare was applied theology pretty much, and it was largely, largely administered in monasteries. Now, we also have precursors of pharmaceutical sciences in, um, in Amazing Saints. Uh, one that I picked here is St. Hildegard of Bingen. Uh, among the many amazing things that she did is um, she was also a practicing physician and um, a scientific uh, writer. So her scientific works are the Physica, which contains description of a variety of um, plants. And, uh, and then Cause et Cure describes the diseases and their treatment. So here we can still see the harmony of uh, all the different branches of healthcare together. So actually providing healthcare, researching healthcare, um, and getting the uh, pharmaceutical preparations together, all under the uh, general umbrella of of love, pretty much, of service, service to the sick. Now, <clears throat> there was a little bit of a change in motivation as we proceed through time. Um, in the Middle Ages, Frederick the, the Second uh, was probably instrumental in separating the professions of surgeon, uh, pharmacist, and actual physician. So there we have now a, um, a more monetary motive come into, uh, into play because uh, a lot of these um, now more secular, as far as you can say that for the Middle Ages, um, pharmacists, they were also of course primarily interested in, uh, in making a profit. Um, if we move on to the end of the uh, 19th century, there we really see the, the change from um, small-scale pharmacists to industrial pharmacy and then later on to pharmaceutical industry. And that was both um, a, a shift from the chemical industry into more pharmaceutical applications on the one hand, and then also um, more industrial methods of production for uh, what has been uh, pharmacies or small-scale apothecaries. Um, at the end of the century, we have pharmaceutical sciences emerge or split off, in that case, from, uh, from chemistry, really. So that's why uh, pharmaceutical sciences has a very strong chemistry um, background. And we have the first real successes here in terms of modern medicine. I have a few examples here for you in terms of uh, vaccines and pain medication and so forth, which are, of course, very awesome to have. Now, if we look at today, uh, modern pharmaceutical industry is, uh, is very different. Uh, it's very large, very complex, and uh, very expensive to develop drugs. Uh, there's huge costs associated with um, registration of new pharmaceuticals, uh, mostly due to uh, late-stage clinical trials that are very expensive. And the, um, the cost of registering a new pharmaceutical product is in excess of $2 billion. So um, please remember that number and think about what that means for the development of drugs for uh, areas that are primarily um, poor uh, and maybe don't have a whole lot of patients. So it's a, if, if it's a smaller disease with a smaller patient population in a poor area, how are you going to recover $2.6 billion? So that's, that's a problem, of course. Now, this can only be done by large, um, very powerful industrial uh, organizations. Uh, an example here is J&J &J headquarters. You see the revenues, they're like 100 billion. 
And on the other hand, here, the pharmaceutical market by region, you see that that is concentrated in North America, in Europe, in Japan. Uh, Africa is lumped in with Australia and Asia because otherwise it would be a really tiny sliver there. Now, this model, I don't want to criticize that too hard because it has given us amazing progress in healthcare. Uh, I could fill my whole speaking time just with the, uh, with the advances. I mean, we just have to think about um, pain medicine, right? That's, that's amazing. We have gotten lots of infectious diseases under control for a long time. So don't misunderstand me that I'm uh, trying to uh, criticize this model too much. So let me start with a few successes here. So one is control of infectious diseases. So here's a graph for measles uh, deaths in the U.S. Uh, the scale here is a log scale, so you see that before the introduction of the measles vaccine, we had about somewhere between, say, 400 and 800 dead children every year based on, on uh, measles. And then afterwards, that went to like three or four. So that's an amazing success, of course. And then if you look at the numbers here, 52 million cases prevented, 5,200 deaths prevented, and 17,400 disabilities roughly. So that's, that's awesome, right? Um, another thing that is amazing is that we all get to live two lives pretty much on average. So if you look at life expectancy before, uh, you know, the, really the development of pharmaceutical sciences, not saying that this is the only uh, causal relationship here, but it's certainly interesting to see that the uh, life expectancy was below 40 years. Um, now you can see where we are right now. We are about double that. So that's, that's fairly amazing. We actually live two lives, uh, every one on our, uh, of us on average. And that is true for most of the world with, uh, with some time lag. So yes, that system that we have put in place of um, healthcare globally has had undeniable successes, and that's, that's worth pointing out. However, there are some issues, and that's what I want to get to now. Uh, nearly all of these therapeutics and vaccines have been developed in and for high-resource countries, which is um, or high-income countries. And uh, develop, development there is guided by um, high price, uh, large patient population, and chronic conditions. So for example, asthma medication is ideal for pharmaceutical companies because uh, you will take it for the rest of your life. Uh, it's a large patient population and usually people can afford the medication. And the boundary condition for this development is that of uh, are those of, of uh, well-developed countries. So highly developed infrastructure, um, health and distribution systems, and well-trained health uh, care providers and uh, some level of patient compliance. So that's all available, and that's taken for granted when these things are uh, developed. So you could say, in a nutshell, um, the model is not based on the need, but rather on the revenue. So that's very different from the original idea of, of a Catholic healthcare. So let's look at the need then. So need in a global health context is often measured by what is called a DALI. So that's a disability adjusted life year. Just as a quick example, if, for example, if you contract um, an infectious disease that renders you blind at age five, then you lose 65 years uh, due to disability, that's 65 dollars. If you die of an infectious disease at age 69, <laughs> then it's just one. So it, it shifts the, the burden to, uh, much to the younger population because they lose, they have the most to, uh, to lose, of course. Now, if you look where that is concentrated, that's um, pretty much all in poor countries, um, primarily in Africa, where the rev revenue potential in th that market is, is very low. Now, what is often argued is that, okay, we are developing medicine for the richer populations, and eventually, once they come off pattern and become less uh, expensive, they will also benefit the uh, the more poor countries, so that's, that's still a good model. There's one flaw with that idea, and that is that the disease burden is very different um, by income level. So if you look at the left here, these are low-income countries and the 15 leading 
causes of disability and death. And uh, the color coding is given here, so you can see that it's communicable diseases, that means infectious diseases, maternal conditions, neonatal conditions, and nu nutritional diseases, hunger, pretty much. And that's all red here, right? So you have heart disease and strokes pretty much also in the list, but not, not as prominent. Whereas in rich countries, there isn't a single infectious disease in the top 15 leading causes. So that means um, there's fairly little incentive for pharmaceutical companies to do something about infectious diseases because they're just not in the top causes. So because of the uh, difference in the type of uh, diseases that affect rich and poor countries, the model definitely that we have currently has some limitations. Uh, enough of that part, I, I just now would like to get the, the Catholic perspective in there a little bit more, and for that I'd like to uh, review a few principles of Catholic social teaching. So perhaps first explain very briefly what Catholic social teaching is. Um, it has a long history all the way down to the Bible, but uh, probably most of its body of work is given in these uh, encyclicals starting with Rerum Novarum in 1891. Um, all the way down to the last two ones by Pope Francis. Um, that's, of course, a lot to read. So if you want a brief introduction, brief in quotation marks, uh, you look at the compendium of the social doctrine of the church, which gives a very good um, summary up to the 2004 time point, pretty much. So here I would like to focus on a few principles, and the first one is that of solidarity. And just let me read that out here. Solidarity is a firm and per persevering determination to commit oneself to the common good, that is to say, to the good of all and of each individual, because we are, are really responsible for all. So the idea is that, that every man, man is indeed his brother's keeper. So that's, uh, that goes back to Cain and Abel, of course. Uh, the um, Catholic social teaching proposes a model for society that is based on cooperation and not on conflict. And at the heart of that is solidarity. The, uh, the next principle is that of universal destination of goods. And that is sometimes a little bit challenging, especially for folks that have received more than their fair share of the uh, goods. So the idea here is that the goods of creation are destined for the whole human race and not for just a few of them, a few lucky ones. Um, not to enable the poor to share in our goods is to steal from them and deprive them of life. The goods we possess are not ours but theirs. So that goes back to one of the fathers in the fourth century, St. Uh, John Chrysostom. So the universal destination of goods remains primordial. It doesn't mean that there is no right to uh, private property. The church has always emphasized that that is uh, definitely there, but that folks who have a lot of property are actually um, also responsible to use that property for um, the common good. <clears throat> then we have the preferential option for the poor. Uh, the principle of the universal destination and of solidarity, if you take that together, um, you probably very quickly arrive at the point where you see that we should take care of the poor with particular focus. Uh, not, not just as a byproduct of another process. So for the topic here, that means the disease burden in poor countries should be addressed with priority and not as an afterthought. Uh, lastly, an important principle is that of subsidiarity. It means that a small um, societal unit should do the things that it can without interference from a larger organization. Um, so not so much a top-down, uh, organization. In a way, it's the way like the church is organized, right? Very small structure at the top. Uh, the Vatican has a smaller footprint than most administrations of a university, so it's, a, uh, it's very, very much not uh, a top-down uh, uh, power structure. Um, so what does that mean for the purposes of this talk? There should be a focus on local capacity building. It's not the idea of, well, we'll figure out the solution here, and then we'll give you the solution, and you'll, you'll better be thanking us for it. Um, now, let me provide a few negative examples. So the first one is an unaffordable delivery device. This is very 
common uh, for folks that have asthma or COPD. Perhaps some of you have actually used it already. It's a dry powder inhaler, um, very good drug, uh, very effective. It costs about $2,400 per year. Now you compare that with 65% uh, of the world's population that has an income of less than 3650 you know this is unaffordable for most of the world. Uh, so next one is reliance of develop, on developed infrastructure. We did, don't think about this very much. If we need a vaccine, we go to the pharmacy, we get injected, right? No, no problem. But you need reconstitution. For that, you need trained healthcare personnel. You need to maintain sterility because otherwise you will confer one disease to the, from one to the next patient and you need some reasonable sharps disposal. And all of these things are not necessarily available in developing countries. Um, licensed vaccines that we have currently require continuous cold storage. And especially the ones that we've developed for COVID, they actually, many of them uh, require a frozen storage even. So here is uh, all 62 that the FDA has ever licensed. And you can see not a single one will, uh, will uh, survive at room temperature for um, a, a lot of time. So why is that a problem? So if you look at this picture, it probably shows you right away why that is a problem. This is the road from uh, or to Shabunda in the Kivu region in the Democratic Republic of Congo. On the right hand, you see how the state of that road is. <laughs> it's not very great, especially once it has rained. Uh, it takes about one to three weeks to get a truck through that thing uh, in spite of the fact that it's 40 miles. So how are you going to marry that with a drug or a vaccine that can only survive for like six hours at room temperature? It's going to be bad when it arrives there. Right? It's, it's, not, it's not working. Now there are alternatives. So this now goes into the area of research that I'm directly involved in. In. So we can think about inexpensive delivery devices. There are a few options here. Meter dose inhalers per dose are very inexpensive. There are simple dry powder inhalers uh, that are two-piece plastic parts less than, than a dollar. So you could think about that. You can also think of inexpensive manufacturing technology. Uh, that's one of the areas that I focused on in research is spray drying. <clears throat> one of the reasons is that spray drying is already used in the food industry at very large scale, for example, to make dry milk. So the, the unit cost for this operation is very, very low. Uh, and it turns out with that you can actually make amazingly sophisticated particles. So the next one here are particles that we made for an inhalable tuberculosis vaccine that is in development currently. Uh, I've given you the references down below if you're interested. Uh, these particles are about a tenth of the size of a human hair, and they are uh, designed to be very stable, even at high temperatures, so two years at 40 degrees Celsius. Now you could ask yourself, how do, how do you accomplish something like that? And all we have to do there is look into nature, because there are some plants that can do this. So for example, the aptly named resurrection plant can survive for years upon desiccation in a desert environment. So you take the water away, it kind of shrivels up, uh, and you think, well, that thing is dead. And now it rains, and there it goes again after 20 years or so. It's, it's pretty amazing. It turns out that there is a disaccharide that is um, in this plant, uh, trehalose, that is um, helping the proteins in the plant um, prevent damage on desiccation. And so we've taken this substance and put it into these particles to stabilize the vaccine. So that's, that's a fa fairly simple way of describing this. I'll show you one more result here. Uh, these are um, results for a vaccine that has um, an, an antigen, which is a protein, and an adjuvant to wake up the immune system upon delivery. And here you see the, uh, uh, the adjuvant uh, content, and it doesn't drop. Uh, unless you go to 40 degrees, then it will drop over a longer period of time. But at room temperature, it's, it's actually stable. And both parts of these vaccines are, vaccines are stable uh, for two years now, instead of just a few days. So the technology is definitely there to do this kind of stuff. And it's not just our group, of course, doing that. Here's a, a survey of a variety of spray dried vaccines. And you can see, just looking at the numbers here, we're now dealing with numbers that are 
far greater, oops, wrong direction, sorry about that, uh, 40 degrees, 50 degrees even. Uh, so that is far more uh, applicable to an environment where there is no uh, um, air conditioning. It also allows us to administer these uh, drugs uh, via inhalation, for example, which is thought to be more uh, efficacious or more uh, works better for vaccines to create um, uh, immunity. And it avoids the problems with needles, of course, uh, so you don't have the needle stick injuries and so forth. That's just the part where I wanted to show you a little bit of the technology that is available that could be uh, brought to bear. Now I would like to return to the question of the Catholic angle. So what's the role that the church could play in this? So the Catholic Church has not entered into what I would call pharmaceutical development, at least not on a large scale. Uh, but rather, the focus was on delivering healthcare, and you can see the numbers here. So we have um, 5,200 roughly hospitals, uh, 15,000 dispensaries, and it's estimated that the church uh, provides about a quarter of all healthcare globally. And that's mostly in resource-poor settings. Uh, so you see an example out of Kenya um, there on the, on the left. Um, also, this is provided mostly by women religious. So we have a, a very large army of women religious, like some of them here. <laughs> um, over half a million, 620,000, so more women religious than priests, actually. And many of them are highly educated uh, physicians, pharmacists, and in, in healthcare. Uh, 85,000 alone in Africa, and the numbers are rapidly increasing. They have doubled within one generation in Africa, whereas here it's kind of dwindling down. So for me, that is an opportunity to do further capacity building. So there, there is a large group of people here that are motivated to help, they're motivated to learn. Here's a a conference of the Catholic Bishops um, uh, Department of uh, Health Department of Kenya. You see the, the large number of folks there. Um, so how can that be brought together with pharmaceutical development? And there, there is one example that I would like to show here of a women religious-led capacity building. That is a project uh, in Tanzania. So Sister Zita. Ekoacha, I think I pronounced that roughly right. Uh, she's the head of the Industrial Pharmacy uh, Teaching Unit in uh, Amoshi, Tanzania. And she set up an MSc program uh, with Purdue University. So there you see some um, knowledge transfer and technology transfer um, going over. So we have 100 of students currently there enrolled. and. Uh, for very exciting to me is that the pilot scale vaccine manufacturing plant now <clears throat> are being built. So if you, if you look at this uh, excerpt here from Sister Zita, we are exploring with other organizations, universities, and the church authorities ways to follow on from the basic level into higher academic qualifications that are obviously necessary for pharmaceutical development, and perhaps initiate a pilot project. Um, for the production of quality drugs for Tanzania. And the bigger project will be Tanzanian, Tanzanian owned and controlled. And I think that is the way to go. It's a way to, to um, address the um, specific disease burden in these countries locally with local capacity and with the help of, uh, of the church. For example, the, the local diocese there provided the, um, the buildings and the land for these um, efforts here. Okay, that brings me to a concluding discussion. What would I like to explore with this? Um, it's basically two questions that are on my mind. The first one is, should Catholic religious or secular institutes increase participation in pharmaceutical development? So why aren't the Jesuits developing the next vaccine? It's just, just a question that I'd like to, to, put, to put out there. Um, they're all very smart people. They could do it, right? So uh, uh, there's, 
I just don't necessarily always uh, agree with the idea to criticize things, but then not provide the, uh, the better solution. Um, and then also, the pharmaceutical development is exceptionally expensive because of late-stage clinical trials, right? So they cost hundreds of millions of dollars, if phase three clinical trials, because often you have to have maybe 20, 30,000 um, patients enrolled in these trials. So if they could be conducted locally in hospitals with um, under the direction of uh, women religious, I bet you that the cost would go from 500 million maybe to 50 million, uh, because last time I checked, women religions don't get a get a six-figure salary, right? So, that's, <laughs> uh, but most importantly, perhaps, is that that would this type of work would be guided by the preferential option for the poor. Uh, and without direct emphasis on profit. And there's nothing wrong with profit, but I don't think it should be the, the primary driver for this work. And the second, um, the second thing that is on my mind is shouldn't Catholic scientists from rich countries make their services available for, de for the developing world um, free of change? So that would be kind of reviving the idea of the unmercenaries, right? So I'm not asking all pharmaceutical scientists in the room to take a vow of poverty and do things like that, of course. But but there's certainly there are ways here of realizing that we have been very fortunate, and that maybe perhaps it's time to give a little bit back. Okay, I think that brings me to the end. Time's up. Thank you very much for your attention. So we have time for a few questions here. I think that uh, the life expectancy could be attributed to many other things besides vaccines. Um, obviously, um, water, sanitation, clean water has a much greater effect than sanitation than uh, than vaccines, evidenced by the fact that malaria, which there is no vaccine, is predominant in Africa, but is in unknown anymore since the 1930s in the United States. But that's another question. The bigger question is, you could, you could actually make a relatively easy compromise on the profit motive problem by changing the length of time of the patent, which is currently 17 years and effectively about 20 years in the United States. That's, a, that's something based on more than 200 years, a 200-year-old number. And if you made that number, say, nine years, for instance, you would drastically improve the ability of people in third world countries like Tanzania to produce, not necessarily to create their own vaccines, but once that, once that patent had expired, you know, five, 10 years in, in, they would be able to make basically generics much more readily. So a relatively simple way of freeing you f from some of the costs would be to change, um, at, for at least for drugs, um, to change the number of years for a patent. Yes, so um, a, a few thoughts. I agree with you mostly, uh, almost completely, actually. <laughs> but um, there, is a, there is a twist on the patent side. <clears throat> and that is that um, in my own experience doing a startup, whether you can get patent protection or not will determine whether you get investor money or not. So if... Um, if the life of a, of, the, of a patent gets reduced, the value for the investor gets reduced. So the likelihood that something, something actually gets developed under this scenario decreases. So that's, that's a little bit of a, of a balance there. So, and I guess that is why there's resistance from the pharmaceutical industry to decrease the, um, the patent uh, life. Right, yeah, but it, but it, also, it also cuts into the type of things that get developed, uh, because if you can't get patent coverage on it, um, again, how are you gonna, how are you gonna recover the cost, right? That's the, that's the problem. I don't know whether you should adapt to that. We, we yeah, it, it could. Um, I might be the token pharmaceutical company or a drug company person here. Um, 
so when I first was hired at the pharmaceutical company I worked for, um, we have new hire town halls directly with the CEO. And I work for a small biotech company. And we focus on rare diseases. And so we have all the monetary issues associated with a small patient population, but the high cost of drug discovery. And so I think um, I'm not I'm not sure I want to necessarily start a debate, but um, we need to be careful when we talk about greedy pharmaceutical companies on the business end versus the cost it takes to do good science. Um, and so the the profits profits so i mean are you talking about money that's earned after reinvestment <laughs> um because almost all of the revenue of my company goes right back into the company um to work on other rare disease drugs the more rare disease drugs we have in the market that are all bringing in revenue that would drive costs down for the overall drugs you have one or two rare disease drugs that treat one in 50,000 people, um, it's very difficult to keep the cost of the drug down. Um, and when you look at our executive salaries, they're nowhere near a J&J &J or a Pfizer or anything like that. Um, and so uh, there's just the, the, the cost of doing good science, you know, to develop one, one drug with the army of chemists and biologists and the animal stuff and all that stuff is, is really quite significant. And so just like with uh, GMOs in Monsanto, be, be nice to the scientists. If you've got, <laughs> you got an issue with the admins, that's one thing. But the, the science still is good and there's still a lot of people working on it that's expensive. Thank you. This is a little tangential. You're focusing on sort of the positive aspects of the whole situation, trying to get services to poor people and deal with these diseases that are not so common here. Uh, there's another aspect, and I may be as hoping may have some direct information about this, since you brought, brought up Kenya. Um, a certain private organizations were accused of sneaking um, substances into smallpox vaccines that would make people infertile. And supposedly, the Kenyan Bishops Conference actually had a hired laboratory to test this and, and confirm this. But I have not been able to really follow up the story to its primary sources. Do you have any information about that? Was it actually occurring? No, I don't have any information about that. I know that there are, um, there is a lot of vaccine hesitancy in Africa based on this um, story. Uh, I don't know whether it's true or not. Uh, that's one reason I think a, a, a vaccine that was developed locally would be accepted in in a much better way. Because there is there is um, with a lot of folks there there is quite a bit of suspicion that the motivation of large Western organizations might not align with the local culture and the local values. Or the Catholic Church, for that matter, yes. Let's take one more question before we have a short break. Hello. Uh, thank you for the wonderful talk. Um, I was just wondering, um, the solution that you, you sort of propose um, in the developing of less expensive technologies for um, whether it's drug development, drug administration, um, or ones that are like more more durable to, to long-term transportation and storage, do you feel that for like the best interest of these developing countries, it is better to focus on research in drug development, um, for in less expensive drug development, and like drug manufacturing technology, or if it would be a better use of time and money to dedicate those resources to actual like development so that they could implement the technology that we already have here in the developed world? That's an excellent question. Um, do I have another 15 minutes? <laughs> uh, that has been on my mind quite a bit. Because of, of course, a, a lot of, a lot of the reasons, and that comes back to the, the comment we heard earlier, the, the reasons that um, the situation in developing countries is dire here and there is has nothing to do directly with healthcare, but maybe with other circumstances, I mean, internal conflict, uh, lack of basic things like electricity and water, and so forth. 
And so you could say, well, why, why don't we keep the level of healthcare that we have here and, and just bring them up to that level so the, uh, the technology that we have here becomes ap applicable there, right? So um, the question is whether that is sustainable. So is it possible that the whole world lives at the level of, say, Canada or the US? Um, when it comes to energy consumption, I think the answer is no. If, all, if everyone in the world would consume at the level that we're consuming, um, that would cause, a, cause an issue. So there will, be, there will be some sustainability issues with that, uh, on the one hand. And uh, the other issue still is that of subsidiarity. I think um, there are quite a few diseases that are commonly lumped together under neglected trop tropical diseases. Uh, you know, most people don't even know their names here, um, mostly parasitic diseases and so forth. Uh, m many of them would be um, addressed by getting general sanitation improved and, and things like that, but not all of them. Um, and there will be also re-emergence of infectious diseases because uh, of antibiotics overuse and um, development of antimicrobial resistance. So infectious diseases that are now pl plaguing only the, um, pr pr predominantly the uh, developing countries, it will become a global problem again. So it's not just uh, keeping going with the system as it is and adjusting everyone so that they can make use of it. I think there needs to be some sort of paradigm shift that goes more towards uh, foresight of what is needed instead of what makes a whole lot of money. Uh, and I'm, I'm not criticizing the pharmaceutical company f companies for a, for a revenue model. So I've been in the pharmaceutical world for a long time and I know people that they are very good meaning uh, in general. Uh, but it's just these boundary conditions force you in a certain direction. So you, you simply cannot ignore revenue in a for-profit world. I mean, the shareholders will make an end to that very quickly. Right? So I think there needs to be a branch that we emphasize that is a non-profit um, model for pharmaceutical development that is based on, on the need of the, of the person instead of the revenue potential. And I'm just trying to find a way to, to uh, get there somehow. All right, well, thank you, Dr. Barron, for an excellent talk. <laughs>